everyone, welcome back to this introduction to cultural anthropology. I'm Professor Scaramelli. This unit of the course is divided into three parts. First, I give an overview of 19th and early 20th century anthropological debates about human civilization and development. Then, in the second part, I'll talk about the history and some of the core practices of anthropological fieldwork and anthropology's main research methods. And finally, in the third part of this unit, I'll delve in with you and talk about a more recent example of ethnographic fieldwork. So part one, evolutionism and civilization. So in the early 19th century, anthropology meant the biological study of the development of Homo sapiens. It was seen as a branch of anatomy or a part of natural history. There was also a newer discipline called ethnology, and this was the study of humans in the context of their ethnos, meaning their specific societies or communities. These early ethnologists asked questions about how certain ways of life had come about. In the United States, for example, the Bureau of Ethnology was tasked with cataloging the origins, languages, and customs of various Native American nations who inhabited the American landscape, and making sense of people who many at the time understood to be the living remnants of this pre-European past. In upstate New York, a landowner and attorney called Herring Lewis Morgan believed that ethnographic evidence showed the residues, the leftovers of the olden days, and might help contemporary white readers to a, a, a pure and less corrupt civilization. He wrote a very influential book entitled Ancient Society. It was published in 1877. And in this book, Morgan created a model for all of the world's societies, moving from simpler forms of organizations, for example, the family, to barbarian institutions like the tribe, to what he saw as more complex and sophisticated modern-day nation-states. Each phase of this hierarchy corresponded to a set of religious forms and practices, different kinds of social organization, different types of material culture, and actual people. This indicated a temporal progression from worse to better, simpler to more complicated, but contemporary people, depending on what their cultural forms or religious practices or technologies were, could be slotted into a different scale. In a sense, this allowed people to see societies living in the contemporary moment as being stuck in the past. So for ethnologists like Morgan and like uh, his followers, there was a natural progression of societies from savagery to barbarism to civilization. It's a general progress from lower towards higher achievements. This was very hierarchical. And the people, they believed, lived in their coherent unit. And different racial groups were believed to have different capacities for advancing on this ladder. I would like you to pay attention to this image in the video. Do you recognize this building? You might have seen it. This is the United States Library of Congress. It's the largest library in the world. A series of 33 ethnographic heads decorating the exterior wall of this building illustrated Morgan's progression from a, a blonde European man and a European brunette situated on the front of the building to the people of Australia and Sub-Saharan Africa out at the very back. This was just a, a visual example of how this racist hierarchy of development permeated uh, everyday life and important cultural institutions. And the ethnographic heads are still there to this day. So this view of the world was rooted and, and, and stemmed from two different kinds of evolutionary theories. And I'm gonna talk about that for a little bit. Herbert Spencer, an English biologist living in the 19th century, popularized the term survival of the fittest. He took some of the core ideas from Charles Darwin's book on the origins of species and portrayed it instead as a struggle for survival, a ruthless struggle. Spencer's main idea was that social development was also determined by natural forces and competition. 
So inspired by this work, uh, but also responding to it, the social evolutionists argued that social change was a human-centered progression from lower to higher forms of thought, behavior, and institutions. In doing so, what, what the social evolutionists did was to separate culture from biology, but only partially. Okay, let us pause for a second. This is fairly abstract. Can you think of a concrete example of social evolutionism thought you have encountered in your own experiences, in your everyday life, in your studies or work, or even in movies, in board games, computer games, or any form of popular culture? Write down any examples that come to mind. From the previous unit of this course, you'll remember old Franz Boas, the German professor at Columbia University, who was also Margaret Mead's teacher. Boas really disagreed with this grand theory of, of civilization and, and human change. And more specifically, he really disagreed with the idea that all human societies proceeded alongside the same path, following the same phases in a hierarchy and a ladder. Instead, through his studies, Boas had observed that the same environments, in fact, produced different kinds of human practices, different artifacts, different cultural forms, and it was really just contingent historical encounters that uh, accounted for the development and histories of particular societies. There were many and multiple lines to follow, and they were all wrapped up and entangled. And there was not just one simple ladder going up towards higher and better societies. Civilization for Boas was not an absolute term. So for example, Boas wrote, you, you can't look at the collection of bows or arrows or canoes or any other technological artifacts from different cultural groups from different parts of the world and then see them as evidence of different societies stuck at the same stage of development. Instead, he said, you have to understand these artifacts, these practices, these technologies in their own historical and cultural contexts. And the empirical evidence that Boas and other anthropologists gathered pointed to a more plural instead of just one universal, more fluid instead of static and unchanging, a more adaptable nature of, of humans, human bodies and human societies. These were revolutionary and anti-racist ideas of the turn of the century. And in this, Boas was in conversation with prominent African-American scholars and intellectuals like W.E.B. Du Bois and others. I want to move us to part two of this lecture, early ethnographic fieldwork. In the 1920s, the field of anthropology went through a second revolution, and this one was not about the grand theories of human societies, but more concretely, it was about research methods or what anthropologists concretely do during the course of the research. So in this unit, we will read the introduction of an ethnography entitled Argonauts of the Western Pacific by Bronislaw Malinowski. The book was published in 1922. So here you're joining hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of students who've poured over these pages and talked about them and analyzed them and situated them in, in their historical context. So who was Malinowski? Malinowski was the son of a Polish linguist. His father had specialized in the study of Slavic languages and folk dialects. And in Krakow, in Poland, Malinowski has studied physics, mathematics, and also philosophy. And then Malinowski moved to Leipzig in Germany, and he got really into studying a field of folk psychology. Uh, folk psychology was the study of mental products created by a community of human life, meaning just collective ways of thought. Malinowski's teacher, uh, who is called Wilhelm Bundt, had been inspired by the work of German philosophers Johann Gottfried von Herder. And Herder has suggested that communities had their own framework for making sense of the world. Every community possessed its own culture, and culture was a coherent set of traits, beliefs, customs, and worldviews. Little connection here, while a student in Germany, Boas had also read this work, and in fact, he bought all of 40 volumes of Herder's entire collected works and hauled these heavy volumes onto his transatlantic ship to New York. Okay, back to Malinowski. So Malinowski moves from folk psychology to studying the family forms of Australian Aboriginal people. 
and it seems a little random, but it really was a hot topic at the field at the time. He arrived at the London School of Economics in London, obviously, to study ethnology, this new field. Until then, Malinowski had not really done any type of research fieldwork. Um, all of his data had come from reading colonial travel accounts and missionary governmental reports. But in 1914, Malinowski set off to Australia and then spent two years in southern New Guinea, called Papua at the time. And there he ended up on a small island on the southeast coast of New Guinea, where he did some research and then during the second trip, moved to an archipelago called the Turbrian Islands. Again, the existing structures of British colonial rule facilitated his travels and his logistics. Okay, let's take a look at this regional map first. Look at it carefully. Do you notice anything wrong? So the map shows how a French naturalist of the 1830s had divided up the people living in the wider Pacific. Here you see Polynesia, meaning the many islands, Micronesia, meaning the small islands, Malaysia, the place of the Malay people, and Melanesia, which referred in a racist term uh, to people with darker skin and, and, and hair. So this was a racist uh, classification of geography, terms that then appear to be natural descriptors of geographic features and regions. European travelers and scientists saw a, a racial and a social order at play here, uh, with Polynesians being considered the, the barbarians of the Pacific and Melanesian the lower-ranked savages with darker skin. These were all legacies of Morgan and others racist thought and social evolutionism ideas, and this is how they were naturalized in, in things like this map. Okay, back to Malinowski. I'm going to read you the opening of the first chapter of his ethnography. Picture me in Malinowski's voice of glasses and all that. Imagine yourself suddenly sat down, surrounded by all your gear, alone on a tropical beach, close to a native village, while the launch or dinghy which has brought you sails away out of sight. Since you take a boat in the compound of some neighboring white man, trader or missionary, you have nothing to do but to start at once your ethnographic work. Okay, and with this paragraph, Malinowski describes his arrival and the beginning of his ethnographic research work in the Trobian Islands. It is one of the most quoted passages of anthropological writing, but take a couple of minutes and, and, and reread it and Analyze it. What are the things that you notice? What stands out to you in this passage? So for me, a couple of things that stand out here are first an emphasis on remoteness, the lonely experience of the ethnographer, maybe also an assumption of difference, of alterity, the study of the other as a precondition for this kind of social analysis. I also notice the ethnographic authority, the authority that comes from uh, the claim of being there in person, in the flesh. And notice how the passage is written in the second person, addressing the reader, addressing you, and inviting you to be with the anthropologist, maybe even to be the anthropologist, to be there. And notice also the references to the colonial structures, they all but vanish uh, in the rest of the book. So this first chapter of the Argonauts became a sort of method reference for generations of anthropology students, and it's probably the first description of the ethnographic process. Malinowski described different stages an ethnographer might experience once he's arrived with his little dinghy in a place like the Turban Islands. First, he describes he felt hopelessness and despair. He was bored and despondent. As he couldn't speak the local Turban languages, he had to rely on translators and on local Pidgin English. With little knowledge and contacts, he was nevertheless able to get what he called some concrete data, like taking a, a census, writing down genealogies, drawing maps, collecting local kinship terms, and so forth. Well, what Malinowski was really interested in, however, what was he called the real native mentality and behavior. And this required mastering what Malinowski called the ethnographic magic, 
the capacity to evolve, in Malinowski's word, the real spirit of the natives. Okay, a little aside here, note that in this discussion of methods, there is never any discussion of any agreement and consent between Malinowski and his local hosts, uh, and rather it, it's a quite strong uh, entitlement to extract information for the pursuit of science and to research a community's ways of life without asking for permission and without any consideration of reciprocity or safety. And we, we will contrast that with the later anthropological works that you read for this unit and in the following weeks of this course. So for Malinowski, real ethnography required a constant, long-term and uninterrupted immersion into communities' everyday life based on specific and rigorous methodologies for gathering evidence. And this was the scientific enterprise of anthropology for Malinowski. Over time, Malinowski described your informants, your interlocutors, become the companions you seek out when you're lonely. And then you become intimately familiar with their practices, their beliefs. While walking around the village, Malinowski could observe how people went about starting their days, the, the quarrels, jokes, family scenes. By being there, one was able to join events as they unfolded in real life, in real time, whether these were dramatic, unexpected events or big rituals or just everyday life. These were all things that one couldn't quite record systematically. It wasn't just a matter of drawing a chart or, or, or crafting a map or taking census data. And Malinowski called all of the things that one observes and learns, uh, he called it the imponderabilia of actual life. The imponderabilia of actual life meant the intimate aspects of everyday life, how you take care of your body, how you cook, your friendships, your hostilities, the tone of a conversation, individual ambitions, emotional responses, small acts and attentions, preferences, sympathy and antipathies. So even in observing a scripted and formal ceremony or ritual, Malinowski writes, you should really pay attention at how people themselves experience it. And so notably in, in this chapter, Malinowski calls attention to the gap between three things, between what people say they do, what people do, and how they understand what they do. So how do anthropologists record or capture this imponderabilia of everyday life? Well, they take what is called field notes. These are organized jottings that describe how things unfold and the ethnographer's presence in them. Part three, ethnographic fieldwork as an interpersonal process. So let us leave Malinowski in his little Trobin Island with his interlocutors and trying to make sense of this imponderabilia of everyday life. And let me take you on a time travel of six decades into the future and follow another anthropologist at work. This is a young woman uh, in, in her 20s called Laila Abulugad, and she joined a community of Aulad Ali Bedouins in Egypt in the late 1980s. And as an anthropology PhD student, she didn't quite know yet what kind of research questions she wanted to focus on. She asked, uh, or she wondered, what was important to the Awalad Alis themselves? And it took Abu Lugad a, a few months of living with this community, with this large extended family, to notice something that in retrospect had been apparent to her from the first day. So Abu Lugad noticed that Aulad Ali people interspersed their everyday conversation with short two-line poems. And these poems were always about emotions. They were about love, they were about pain, they were about longing, they were about home and nostalgia, desire, grief. So for example, one day Abu Lugad overheard the wife of a shepherd who had come to the house to where she stayed to help bake bread for this extended family. And the shepherd woman recited, I wonder is this pair a passing shadow or my companion for life? And later that night, Abu Lugad talked about this poem with, the, with her host. He was the, uh, an older man. He was the patriarch of the family who hosted her in Egypt. And her host became very agitated. He wanted to tell Abu Lugad to tell her who had recited this poem. 
And after he learned that uh, Abu Lugad had heard it from the shepherd's wife, he relaxed and he was relieved. Uh, as it turns out, the woman had lost a husband in the past and her, her current husband was about to die. He was very old. But the patriarch had been worried that it was his own wife who had been the one reciting the poem. And later that night, the patriarch's wife scolded Abu Lugad for talking about women's poems with, with a man. So she both understood a cultural norm, but in, in talking about it, in discussing it, she had also breached an implicit understanding of who was allowed to discuss this, these poems uh, explicitly. So these two liners really interspersed everyday conversations among Aulad Ali's. And interestingly, they were really different from the way people generally displayed or downplayed their emotions and their vulnerability. Abu Lugod was fascinated. For the Bedouin community that she lived with, she had learned over months of living there, expressing feelings of romantic love, uh, longing and sadness was really seen as immoral. And being weak and dependent was, was shameful. To be an, an honorable man or a woman, one had to learn to express indifference, to downplaying anger. And yet these poems which people use in everyday conversations conveyed strong sentiments of love, longing, fragility, suffering and desire, emotions that couldn't otherwise be expressed. And over time, over the course of her research, Abu Lugad recorded hundreds of these poems, they're called Ginawas, and also took notes, ethnographic notes on, the, on her everyday life in this Aulad Ali community. So interestingly, many other researchers had written about poetic forms in the region, but they had largely focused on long epic poem narrated by men, generally in public and political contexts. But Abu Lugad's own gender identity as a younger woman allowed her to access these intimate and informal practices and spaces that were, had been precluded to others. And as she continued taking part in the everyday life of the women of this extended family of the Aulad Ali's patriarch, Abu Lugad over time herself became like a, like a daughter uh, for the family with all the expectations and behaviors and responsibility and work of, and comportment that came with her family position. So with this example, I want to show how the positionality, the identity of the ethnography really matters fundamentally to the research process. And this is not simply about charting out fixed axes of identity or gender, race, class, religion, and so forth. It really is fundamentally about the process of becoming, the forms relationships between the ethnographer and the individuals in the communities that they study. And these relationships form over time. But this is why we talk about an intersubjective process. So you've read the first pages of Abu Lugad's book for this unit. And these first pages describe her driving through a landscape from the city of Alexandria in Egypt to the Western desert where the Aulad Ali Bedouins live. Abu Lugad describes crude cement houses painted in blue, yellow, pink, surrounded by tents and fields of barley, olive groves, orchards, fig groves. And these are the extended homes of the Aulad Ali's who are former nomadic people, now sedentary. Abu Lugo writes that she has learned to see that landscape in the way that she describes in the first pages of the book only after months of living with the Aulad Ali. This wasn't just a description of place, but it was really a, a social landscape where some others might see a desolate desert or a stinking, smelly marsh. She saw the different households who occupied a certain territory and their cultivation practices and their relationships and friendships and kinship and histories and so forth. And the scent of the marshes of Lake Mariut meant that she was getting close to a place that had become her home. So becoming a member of the family uh, gradually involved shared responsibilities. So for example, Abu Lugad would be limited in her ability to make social visits to other families, even though that would be desirable as a, as a researcher to do so. So the point was that her visit to another family 
which you would want to do as an ethnographer to talk to other people and observe their everyday life and uh, take notes on that and so forth. But this visit would create a social obligation between the host family and Abu Lugad's new interlocutors. And the host family might not want to have the relationship. They might not want to be in this kind of that relationship and have to repay it. And so everything that she said and did as a researcher also was reflected on her host family. And so over time, this is how Abu Lugad was socialized into a new role, again, a quite fairly complex one, right? At the same time, anthropology PhD student, but also host daughter. And her role involved helping, uh, for example, to greet guests who would come to the house, to gather wood, to cooking with the other women at the house, knowing what to wear for festive occasions or how to mourn at the funeral. And it is this intersubjective transformation and this process that forms then the core of Abu Lugad's ethnographic observation and writing and theory. And this is really, really important for the way anthropology has been done in recent decades. So I would like you now to take a few minutes and compare what you have gathered so far of Abu Lugad's research methods with the Aulad Ali Bedouins in Egypt against Malinowski's research with people of the Torbian Islands. What are some of the core methodological practices or beliefs that Malinowski and Abu Lugad share? What are some of the key differences that you notice? And I'm insisting that you think of methods in particular historical and social context and to the actual people who do ethnography because this will prepare you to become a practicing anthropology over the course of this Introduction to Cultural Anthropology course. So to, to conclude in this unit, uh, I wanted to emphasize that we understand ethnographic research as a process of transformation and socialization, one in which you learn to take on certain new social roles and be able to uh, act following shared societal expectations. And in the following units of this course, we're going to talk about how that translates into writing ethnographic field notes and writing social analysis, but we'll explore many other topics as well. Well, thank you for joining me for this unit, and I look forward to seeing you all very soon.